confessional booth to receive the sacrament of penance. A contrite sinner goes before Christ in the person of a priest who hears the sins, gives out a penance, which is usually prayers, and absolves the sinners through the name and the power of Jesus Christ. And I thought this idea of confession was quite apt for the Lenten season. And that's where I thought I was going. But instead today I'd like to take you in a different direction. And that is the history and the meaning of the cross and the sign of the cross. Did you know that today's understanding of the cross, such as this one, or this crucifix, I know this is kind of small, our understanding of it today is very different than first century Christians. Now I'm speaking about its shape and its association with the Trinity, and even the, the place that it had in the life and death of Jesus. For example, Jesus probably did not die on a cross. Jesus probably did not die on a cross. The Greek word storos in the Bible is now better understood to translate to tree or pole or stake. The first use of a physical cross along these lines, it wasn't exactly like this, didn't happen until the 4th century. And it wasn't depicted in Christian art until a hundred years after that. And the crucifix, and the crucifix is a cross with Jesus' body on it, like this one. It didn't appear till the 7th century. <clears throat> and the Roman Catholic Church adopted this particular cross of the 7th century many, many years later. The actual origin of the cross probably occurred when humans first started to rub sticks together to create fire for protection, for warmth, for food, for tools. Thousands of years before Jesus' birth, the cross, not, not the crucifix, but a cross, was the symbol for the Babylonian sun god. All right, and then we go forward to 312 CE. Sun-worshipping Roman leader Constantine, he had a vision of a sign in the sky that identified Christ with the cross. This is 4th century. By one account, Constantine saw the words, and this sign conquer, that he felt assured him 
of his next victory in battle. And the next battle was an important one, pivotal. And sure enough, his underdog army, with shields imprinted with the cross, went on to triumph. And what happened to Constantine? He became emperor of the West, and he promoted Christianity to be the religion of the empire and the cross as its sign. Before long, Archbishop of Con Constantinople, St. John Chrysostom, he wrote, never leave home without making the sign of the cross. Never leave home without making the sign of the cross. I think American Express tapped on that one. Um, <laughs> Then the father of Western Christianity, St. Augustine of Hippo, weighed in. What else is the sign of the cross but the cross of Christ? My friends, despite this association of the cross with politics and power and war and battles, there's good news to be found. Early Christians were familiar with the custom of branding cattle. Just. Early Christians were very familiar with the custom of branding cattle, uh, possessions, even slaves to mark their ownership. And it was a natural move for the earliest Christians to begin crossing themselves as belonging to the Lord being claimed by Christ. Many early Christians lived in slums. They were very poor. Some were slaves, women without power, and men struggling with their trades to eke out a living. The gift of this sign, this tracing, was given to Christians at their baptism and their baptismal renewals. And it was liberating. So no matter what was happening in the Roman Empire, no matter how much suffering there was, they belonged to Christ. Their signing of a small cross with the finger on one's own forehead was not connected with the Trinity. And I think that's how we often think of the cross. The Trinity was not in the Bible. The Trinitarian doctrine came to be in the 4th century, although there were earlier hints of the Trinity in the, in the Bible. But I'm talking about explicitly. So when early Christians made the sign of the cross, and I want to demonstrate on my own forehead, I hope this works because I don't have a mirror. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Um, it was often in the form of an X, a Greek X. And what does Greek X stand for? It was the first letter in the name of Christ, so it was an abbreviation for Christ. They also sometimes used the Greek T. And it stood as a symbol for the resurrection. Now, presumably, early Christians were taking their cues from such scripture passages that Art read earlier, Galatians 6.17. I carry the marks of Jesus branded on my body. And Revelation 22.4. God's name will be written on my forehead. So let's take a little bit, a little look at some more of the history of the cross and the signing of the cross. By the 11th century, we see the signing of the cross as starting at the forehead, moving down to the chest, to the left shoulder, and across to the right shoulder. And it was an ex expression of the Trinity. And nobody knows they don't have anything 
really evident in history as to how it went from a small tracing on the forehead all the way up to across the body. But we do have uh, the prayer book of King Henry, which gives this instruction. Mark the Holy Cross on the four sides of the body. And this is in the 11th century. My favorite, one of my favorite theologians is Martin Luther, and he was 16th century, and he inspired the Protestant Reformation. He really liked the sign of the cross. And that really surprises me because Martin Luther was adamantly opposed to anything that wasn't explicitly in the Bible. But he even had it in his small catechism, and I'll read you an excerpt. The Christian begins his days, his prayers and his activities with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The baptized person dedicates the day to the glory of God and calls on the Savior's grace, which lets him act in the Spirit as a child of God. The sign of the cross strengthens us in temptations and difficulties. So it was said that every morning when Luther got up out of bed, he would put his hand on his head like this and say, I am a baptized person, and today I will live out my baptism. The practice of signing the cross to, to really invoke the Trinity extends well beyond Catholicism. It's not just a Catholic practice. It is used by the Eastern Orthodox traditions, the Episcopal Church, and many Presbyterian and Lutheran churches. It bears many meanings over its long history, a mark of belonging to Christ, renewal of baptism, a reminder of, about self-indulgence and doing wrong, and the acceptance of life's suffering. But for me, it's always going to be that reminder of being in the confessional booth and near the end making the sign of the cross and then saying aloud what is known as an act of contrition, expressing your own sorrow for your sins. And part of that is declaring your intention, I will go and sin no more. I will go and sin no more. And so it is. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. The Imposition of Ashes. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about Ash Wednesday, Ash Saturday. It's when we begin our journey to Easter, and the sign is the ash. And it's an ancient sign that speaks to our frailty and the uncertainty of our human lives. The ash calls us to repentance. And it's a symbol that urges us to place our hope in God alone. So we all know now that Ash Wednesday begins Lent. It is a time when we stop, we hit the pause button, and we assess how we're doing in our walk with God. This day of ashes is not in the Bible. But our faith is made up of Bible, traditions, rituals, personal experience, the Day of Ashes, though, is connected with the Bible. Scriptures inspire the 40-day Lenten period because it ties in with 
Jesus' 40 day in the wilderness, and there are other connotations to the number 40. And the use of ashes is in the Old Testament. So Lent is a time that helps us to identify what we need to let go of in order to live more fully into our relationship with God. Thank you, Dean and Bob. Thank you. As you begin your journey into Lent. So we use ashes as an outward expression of our desire to begin again. Ashes are a sign of physical death, as in ashes to ashes, dust to dust. In Old Testament times, people used ashes to reflect mourning or penitence. By receiving ashes, we proclaim our intent to die of our worldly desires and live more into Christ, which is the focus of Lent. And Lent is a Latin term for spring that recognizes the lengthening of the days. For over 1,200 years, faithful followers of Christ have received ashes upon their forehead, often in the sign of the cross. 1,200 years. That's a long tradition. Ashes are generally made from the burnt palms that were blessed in the previous year on Palm Sunday. Now, early Christians, their view of Lent is very different than ours. During the first six centuries, Lent was the time of preparation for the great Easter Vigil, when new Christians were baptized and the rest of the congregants had renewal of their baptismal vows. And there was that signing of the cross. The length of the Lenten season varied. In the earliest of Christian times, we find some evidence it was only three days. Then it extended into a holy week. And then the fourth century, it became the 40 days. So early times, Christian times, we see Lent connected with baptism, which was central to the Christian life. Unfortunately, much of that connection has been lost in our contemporary times. So I'm going to move to an invitation. I invite you, in the name of Christ, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination, reflection, perhaps it's readings, looking at Holy Scripture, fasting was very common in early times, works of love, whatever it is. I can't tell you what's right for you, only you know what's right for you and what you feel called to do. So these are our ashes. They have been blessed. And what I'd like to do is come around to each of you and Use the ash to make the sign of the cross on your forehead. And if you prefer, I can do it in your palm. And if you prefer not to have ashes at all, I'd be happy to do a blessing. Or you're welcome not to participate in any way. So whatever you do is OK. And Karen will play the cello for us during this period of imposing the ashes. <laughs> 